There may be a way of open sourcing some generic e-commerce blah 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 system, but the, that piece of code that you're writing there, you have to keep that very simple, you have to keep, you have to not repeat yourself. And maybe that needs a process, maybe it doesn't, but I think there's some sort of fine line that you need to find. And I think it's your own line that you find for where to test and where not to test using simple tests. And I, I tend not to ever use the um, the browser, the, the browser simulating testing, that I can't remember the name of the, the class, but there's Drupal unit test which just does proper unit tests and I love that, but then there's I think it's Drupal web test case and I just cannot stand it, it's just horrific, it takes an, it takes ages to run the full switch, you know? it can take half an hour even on quite a powerful machine, so I just don't do it, it's, it's hard. And if, through me not doing that, I've learned to write code that can be unit tested properly rather than trying to test some Drupal form. You know, you find yourself, if, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you've written a form, you've got a submit handler, and the way to test this is to write a Drupal web test case, you've just fallen into one of Drupal's traps, which is you haven't properly abstracted the functionality that you're providing. You've just put it in a form, and you've put it in a form submit handler. That stuff should be abstracted, so it's a piece of functionality that does something that you can unit test if you want to unit test it. Having things just live in submit handlers is it's evil. It eventually will bite you the first time you want to put that piece of functionality somewhere else or use it more than twice. What are you going to do with that submit handler? It doesn't mean anything. Ah, ranting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, th I, I saw this thing on the internet. I haven't got a, um, a picture of it, but. It was, it was always to imagine the next person to look after your code is an, is an insane axe murderer. I think that sort of sets the bar for how good you should be trying to do this stuff. <coughs> um, there's a software engineering principle called dry, don't repeat yourself. And from Wikipedia defines this as when the dry principle is applied successfully, the modification of a single element of a system does not require a change in other logically related elements. Often, in Drupal, this is not the case. You go and change some form, you've got to go and mess around with a theme for it. You go and change some menu hook, you've, you may, you've got to go and change some loader for that. You've got to change the access call that you've got to set. I think that these software engineering principles are, are still solid. They're rock solid. They've been around 20 years, and that we just don't follow them tightly in Drupal. So, but there's nothing to stop you following these good principles like single responsibility <coughs> or don't repeat yourself in your Drupal code. You know, that it, following these sorts of principles means that you're going to be able to maintain the thing in fewer lines of code as you start maintaining your site once it's going live. And I, and I do think that you're maintaining the site, even if it hasn't gone live yet, as soon as you've got code in master, as soon as you've got that initial two week push out that you've done to your staging server, you're, you're, you're in maintenance mode, you'll have data that you don't want to wreck. Um, so, really try and do this. I've got an example of where Drupal does this terribly, and this is not because I'm here to attack Drupal, it's because I'm here to, to, to just show us a silly example that Drupal has. And, I, and the example I'm about to show, Drupal does this because of performance, but I think the fact that it has to do it because of performance means that the thing that calls it is sort of architecture, in this case, um, for, for static caching was wrong in the first place and they should have gone and fixed that problem and I didn't go and fix that problem and so I'm just as bad or I'm probably worse because I didn't try so I am worse so look at this look at this piece of code this piece of code is in Drupal core about 50 times apart from the languages word which is you know you put whatever you want there and it essentially gives you a page level cache uh, or a request level cache um, where you can just store stuff in it for every time you function it. So, for instance, when you, in this case it's languages, so it looks up the languages and when, once, it's, once it knows what languages your sites are, have, it just stores a list of them. So, this gets called all over the time, and, and, and it's this exact same piece of code that gets, just gets you this nice little reference to um, this static area. You can do this in one line of code in PHP. This is just static dollar languages. But the reason they do this is because when you clear a cache somewhere else and you need to call this page again, or you need to call this function again on the same page, you need those static things to have been reset. In Drupal 6 you used to be able to pass in a, a reset parameter, but now you have to do this weird thing where it caches itself. But you have to include all of this crap code in, in, in every function that you write that needs this. So 
Take this example. Hold on. There. I've got a page that's portal account order and then percent donkey. So donkey load is going to get called to fill the value of donkey when we call P1 account order detail page and pass in percent donkey. So that does a big query of something. In Drupal Core, that will get called three or four times on every page load, minimum, because it's because it's a the menu gets evaluated by like translation and access and all the various things. So if you simply do that big query, you'll end up doing it four times. It's hideous. That, that will kill your site eventually. So you'd go back and you'd put that thing in it. I've only gone back on my laptop. You'd go back and you'd put that thing in it and you'd put a little bit of code that says, if I've got do a big query for dollar donkey. Don't do this and just return it. But why should you do that? You shouldn't do that. What it should do is the system that calls your function in the first place should just know it's already called it and return the thing for you. It shouldn't do that. So this is an example of where Drupal doesn't follow the don't repeat yourself principle. And it causes you all sorts of pain where you have to have these crazy lines. And I, I still get freaked out where you're getting this static pointer to this function name variable, but then on the next line you reset that to an array, but it doesn't wipe the fact that it came from there, it's just that you move, and, and it just screws, it just breaks my head. <laughs> Have I put the slide for don't repeat something twice? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 um, <coughs> so when you're building a Drupal site, I think you should, am I, I'm going to carry on. Um, when you're building a Drupal site, I think you should focus solely on the quality of that Drupal site. Um, and that might sound silly that you're thinking about outsourcing this and, and open sourcing this and blah, 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 blah. I think all of that comes after you have a working site. And in general, the Drupal coding standards are focused on building distributable code. So the Drupal coding standards will encourage you to write things like um, some piece of code where you're exposing your own hook. So let's say I'm building my Donkey Sanctuary website um, that I'm just alluding to. Um, I'm never going to open source this inventory management for donkeys that ends up in a supply chain that ends up in Tesco Burgers, but I want <laughs> this thing to be high quality. So I want to be, I want to say change the, I've got custom breadcrumbs, I'm trying to make up an example as we go, I've got custom breadcrumbs and I want to make them up per page. It makes much more sense for me to write one discrete functional class that figures out what is happening and just present the breadcrumbs or provide the array that provides the breadcrumbs than it does to, to invoke your own hook that says, well, I'll let any module alter these breadcrumbs. Why do you want any module to alter them? It's your one site that you're building. Your one site should do your one thing cleanly. So I think in most cases, unless you're going to distribute this code, you're going to open source this code, and you want it to be editable by anyone in situations that you haven't imagined, like Drupal Core, which I mean, it's a perfect way for Drupal Core to do it. You shouldn't do things like write your output books. So always know whether you're writing distributable code or not. Distributable code has those extra headaches, like hooks, that you just, that in most cases, you don't need. You could, you could achieve your, your end goal in fewer lines of code, fewer bugs, you know, fewer horror points, fewer bits of indirection where you simply don't know where that code is. You know, you've got this hook invoke, donkey sanctuary, breadcrumb, menu, blah, blah, right? And then you've got the Steve module over there that implements this. You know, you, when you're just looking at a bug, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to grep the code, you know. And we all grep the code base when we're looking for these crazy hooks, but it doesn't make it a good thing. If you've just got one function that says do the breadcrumbs, and one class do the breadcrumbs. If you're not distributing that, that's way easier to manage over time. And um, in, in that, that flows into this bottom up and top down um, point here, which is if you think about some of the other frameworks out there, think about a Symfony or a Rails or a general MVC framework, the, mo the model of development is bottom up in that you get given a pile of sort of functionality that you can assemble, you can turn on, you can you can configure in such a way that you you say to the user system, I would like you to work in this way and I would like you to do this and I would like you to do this. Whereas 
the top-down approach is Drupal's approach, typically, which is where Drupal and lots of contributing modules present you with, um, here is your user system, you know, you can register, when you register you have these options, you can blah blah blah, you know, and that is the default, the node system here, you can add fields, and it's all beautiful, and it's all fabulous, and it's brilliant for building sites. And, and you know, within that sort of time, then you go and alter those things, and you, and, but you're having to do the altering yourself. Whereas when you use the other frameworks, you don't really get any of that stuff. You might get some system for adding fields to something, you might get some system for a user registration, but you're putting that together. And I think this is the main reason you don't see many startups building in Drupal. It's because when they're sort of thinking about this idea that they're going to build, they're going to do this thing, why do they want to have to alter the way something works when they're trying to build this new exciting thing? They want to take things that have been built and construct them in such a way that takes them forward. Right? Maybe Drupal 8 will help with this with the city of the parents. Who knows? I think you have to be very aware of when you're developing your custom modules of the fact that you are in a top down approach and that you're waiting for stuff. You're altering existing things rather than just creating what you want. And I just think you have to be aware of that. And my last, my last thing about community participation, I think one of the greatest ways of improving your own quality is to learn from reviews, and whether they're reviews of your own code or whether they're reviews of other people's code on Drupal.org, you should spend some time just reading it. And um, my quality has been um, increased. It wasn't that high to begin with, it's still not that high, but it's been increased massively from trying to get into Drupal Core. I got into Drupal Core, it took me about a day of, of effort spread over a, you know, a few days or whatever, and I think anyone can. I mean, I changed the word, the, most small, the smallest patch, I think, ever. I got into Drupal Core, but I can say I'm a Drupal Core developer. In Drupal 6, when you did updates, at the end of it, it would say go to main page. In Drupal 7, it says go to front page. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or I'm um, Alper and Albert and I said probably one else. What do you do to keep track of your larger to do's if you pack them out? Even the smaller ones. Um I, I complete them. <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be putting out code that's that's just not done. I mean, if you've got areas of the code that you, you think you need to refactor at a later point, well then you should do the simplest thing that works. So you shouldn't be putting out code that um, that has loads of comments saying, in the future I'll add this section, this section, this section. If you want to do something like that, create a ticket in your book tracking for that. But I don't think you should pollute the code with those sorts of um, things. I think the code should be, you know, when it goes over, you know, it should go over the... Steve, what do you do when you encounter with the contract module that, that doesn't apply those principles? You know, they don't repeat yourself, but you... you I mean, I encounter, I'm not going to name the module, it's quite a sizable module, and, and um, it, it, it just it fell foul of a uh, process of adapting to new, you know, new needs for this module and then bad practices fall in and you see instances of, of, of repeating the code in order, like hacking their own solutions, but the module, you recognise that the module still has those flows that you need to do when it would have taken a sizable effort to make it so that can re reduce the redundancies, but um, if we take all of the principles that we're talking about on board, then, then we really should take ownership of this country module and solve the problem. Well, I, I think if you've got to be practical about it, haven't you? I mean, one of the reasons we all use Drupal is because you get a load of stuff for free and you only have to alter parts of it. You know, some of that top down, bottom up thing, you know, it kind of kills you to think <coughs> in a bottom up mode because yeah. with Drupal you get so much that's given to you. I think you have to just pick your battles, don't you? It's, it's hard. Yeah. I don't think you should go around randomly editing all contract modules because you'll never deliver a site. I was just thinking with the, the bottom out, bottom up, top down stuff, do you have like a process in where you look at something that you've got to build and you go, 
right, I can do this in Drupal? Or, I mean, do you have, do you have some kind of a checklist or something like that, like, before you start saying, I'm not going to use Drupal to do this because it's actually going to cause me pain? Or would you just use Drupal to do everything? Well, I run a Drupal development company, so we tend to just use Drupal. But there are lots of examples where where you just where why would you use it? You know, I mean, one one very easy way to think about this is to look at uh, Node.js type things and, and Google Go, where you have to handle these long running connections, and Drupal isn't very good at that, and there are ways to hack it. Um, and I, actually, that's a terrible answer. Um, <laughs> so we can look at that. Um, I don't have a checklist, uh, but would I you never not accept some work? Then would you ever say, "I don't think you should be doing this"? In oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think the peer review part and peer review, all the peer review stuff I shared there was people just doing it at the end. But the way we work, we we keep, a, you know, this is just my experience, but we keep a, a chat room open and we we get on the phone when we're going to start building something and say, "Well, I'm going to go blah blah blah, and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that," and you have a chat about it up front. And um, I much prefer that having a chat about it up front to fixing all of the bugs at the end, because it's a five minute conversation or a four hour refactor or some crazy thing. And um, I, th I think that that's, that's slowing down to speed up. You know, I, I'm a special, I suffer from this a lot where I just want to dive in, start coding and get stuff done. And with Drupal, you can get things that show up on the screen so quickly. And then when they go live, they're going to blow up. Or you know, in a few months when you've got a million users, they're going to blow up. So just just taking a little bit of time to think about it doesn't really slow you down. It, sl it slows you down at the bit where you want to run off. But then you just run off. Ten minutes later, you can still run off. So how do you when you're saying you yeah, know your approach is to create a branch for every every change? Do you have a gatekeeper that brings those back into master? Or is everyone allowed to do that? In our team, I mean, I, I guess you could. It depends on how your organisation works or the team that you're working with. But in our team, um, anyone can peer review someone else's code. But that's the way, and that's the way it gets in. Okay. And um, and often you'll see in a peer review uh, in my little company where where it'll just say, "I'm leaving this to Stu because he has blah blah blah." You know. So it, I, I I just I think you should trust the team. Yeah. But generally, in principle, we don't. Commit your own stuff yeah, you never commit your own stuff back to master. It, yeah. it would get reviewed. It would get reviewed. It's a great way of being distributed as well. I mean, you've got distributed developers, haven't you? Yeah. So they're working on their own. It's very easy to get caught in, in your own mindset and just sort of move forward. But again, I think peer reviews doesn't take that long, and you get you, you reduce your bus factor by having someone who's who's put it locally, have a good look at it. Sure. I mean, one of the things we, we do is um, let's say all the things that come. I've got student for the things that have come, Dan got all the things that have come, but well, that's their copy. And in Jenkins, if I've been working on a branch, they go into Jenkins and they just go build Stu, you know, and they've got a branch in and they just put it in. So they haven't got to do all this magical craziness locally to get it all running. So Jenkins. So it makes it easy to review this as well if you put a few tools in place. And you know, the, the system for doing that in Jenkins is, is one or two screens different. Yeah, you just have to push it.